World War II is this massive global event. The United States winds up fighting a war on two fronts. Fighting war on that scale requires a mobilization of the workforce, the entire productive economy. I mean, everybody has to play a part in this. And one of the things that the government advertising does is, is give reasons for you know, what the war is about and who are we fighting. The posters depict the enemy, um, whether in Europe or the Pacific, as, as dangerous, threatening, terrifying. Uh, but it's very interesting to see some of the subtle ways in which the Germans are depicted versus the way the Japanese are depicted. And they are subtle at first, but if you start to look at them and read in, into them a little more closely, I think the, change, the, the differences and the distinctions are really profound. In Europe, it's not that we are fighting Germans, we're fighting Nazis. The Nazis are depicted as uh, you know, terribly threatening. And some of these posters, um, when I show them in 21st century classrooms, and the, the students don't know whether to gasp or to giggle a little bit because the Nazis are portrayed as these terrifying supermen. There's a, a well-known poster that shows just part of a Nazi giant. He must be you know, 80 feet tall because all that's visible is his boot and it's crushing a steeple. And it doesn't suggest that there is anything redemptive um, about the, uh, the opponent in Europe. But it is always very specifically Nazis that we're fighting. It's always Nazis, uh, Nazi swastika. It is an ideology. And that becomes really important because as the war draws to a close and the United States and allies have to start working through this issue of what is the post-war world going to be like, the distinction between fighting Nazis and fighting Germans is really important. The war in the Pacific is very different. We're not fighting an ideology there. We're not fighting the Japanese because of what they believe. We're fighting the Japanese because of what they are. And if you start to tune your eye to those kind of subtle differences that are based in race and ideology, you start to notice some pretty big differences in the way that the Japanese are presented. For many Americans in the wake of Pearl Harbor, the urgency of the war is about revenge against the Japanese, about paying them back for this treacherous sneak attack. One of the, the well-known posters is a very dark image um, that has a, uh, a male figure shaking his fist in the foreground, and the fist is as large as his head to give you some sort of you know, the, the projection into the third dimension. In the bottom third of the poster, you can see the very famous silhouette of the ships on Battleship Row burning and sinking, and then the only text in bright red letters says, Avenge December 7. There is no discussion of uh, the, the political ideology that, that underlays the war against Japan. It is simply the urgent need to revenge this, this terrible act. The distinction, I think, clearly has a lot of its roots in biology. Nazis are often presented as supermen. In some of the posters, they're disembodied. The Japanese are, are generally not portrayed that way. There's sort of an artistic shorthand that artists use to indicate that the figure you're looking at is Japanese. Round eyeglasses, buck teeth. In, in some of the famous uh, posters, the Japanese are all dressed alike. The subtle argument there, I think, is not that the Japanese are, are terrifying individually the way that a Nazi SS officer might might scare a child. The threat is presented, you know, that the Japanese are, are threatening because there are just so many of them. They are an other. They are, you know, presented the way an artist would represent, you know, insects or livestock. You know, when you, when you have a, a large group of people that you, you draw absolutely identically, that's not how we draw human beings. That's how you draw animals or vermin. Theodore Geisel, the cartoonist that we all know as Dr. Seuss, was a very prolific editorial cartoonist during the Second World War. Dr. Seuss was among the earliest to note the, the danger that Hitler's Germany presented and to, to try to underline the folly of American isolationism. In the Pacific, his depictions of the Japanese are, are virulently racist, I mean, poisonously racist. One of the most famous cartoons is called Waiting for the Signal from Home, and it shows the west coast of the United States with the, the 
from top to bottom, Washington, Oregon, and California. Um, and there is an ocean of Japanese and Japanese Americans. It, it's, it's an ocean of people that dissolves into dots as it goes thousands of miles up the coast. And they are all happily standing in line to receive a block of TNT. The fifth column is a, a phrase that had caught on during the Spanish Civil War. A general in the Spanish Civil War is marching on a city, bragged that he had four columns of marching troops um, who were converging on a particular city, but a fifth column inside the city already. And those were the sympathizers who were simply waiting for the moment to rise up. Presenting the Japanese and Japanese Americans, many of whom are citizens on the West Coast, as what in the 21st century we would term a sleeper cell, is you know unbelievably racist. But it's a very compelling cartoon. And I think viewers in the 1940s who are confronted with this incredibly treacherous sneak attack at Pearl Harbor, it fans the flames of their, their mistrust and their animosity towards uh, their Japanese neighbors. And th th there's something really powerful about that image. And it's important to juxtapose it against what's happening on the East Coast with the Germans. There is not a similar kind of suspicion that's nearly as deep about German Americans living in New York City or, or Boston or Philadelphia. German Americans, Italian Americans can argue that because of their whiteness, because of their European heritage, they have been assimilated into the United States. And Americans are willing to believe that. The Japanese, because the racial differences are so much more obvious, it just does not attach. They, they seem so clearly other with a capital O. Uh, that they cannot be be assimilated in the same way. It's a it's a shameful chapter in American history. It's deeply shameful, and the effects of it linger with us today.